Eric asked me, when Eric asked me uh, to be um, a speaker here tonight, I, I was talking to some environmental study students, actually to uh, Kate Leach and, and, and Matt Teutsch, about the fact that I wanted to talk a little bit about groups and about the concept of, of community. So they said, Doc, 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 you got to talk about your muscles. <laughs> I, I know, they're impressive, but uh, not these muscles, but the bivalves that live on the seafloor. I'm a seafloor ecologist, and one of my lines of research is um, looking at um, group living in seafloor organisms. And muscles, the same muscles that you eat, um, uh, aggregate, they move together and aggregate, and um, I did research with uh, three ES students, Tasha Gennaris and Sarah, Sarah Coleman and Danielle Bates-Halsey, who are now all in graduate school, um, and we, we did experiments where we watched uh, muscles move and aggregate and into, into groups, and they do that because um, there are benefits to group living, and predation rates on groups of muscles are lower than muscle individuals living alone. Um, but this comes at a cost because if you live in a group, all the other muscles around you are sucking phytoplankton out of the water and so there's not as much food for you and um, your growth rate slows down and you can't reproduce as much. So there are trade-offs to, um, to group living and um, that's true for muscles and it's true for uh, human beings as well. There are optimal uh, sizes to groups, for example. So I was going to regale you uh, tonight with 18 minutes of fascinating anecdotes about marine bivalves, um, but I, I decided that I'd talk about human beings instead when, luckily for you, I read an, uh, an article in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago that perhaps some of you read uh, an article by uh, Jonah Lehrer about um, groups and about group interactions and about the sort of the psychology and social psychology of, of group interactions. And um, he uh, talked about a number of, of uh, different studies and commented on them, and I, I thought he did a pretty good job. The first one that he talked about was uh, by uh, Ben Jones from Northwestern University who uh, analyzed 20 million academic articles um, that had been published in the literature, and he discovered that over the last 50 years, um, the, let me get this exactly right, the sizes of science teams have gone up about 20% per decade in the, in the last 50 years. Um, he uh, said that science articles by multiple authors are cited twice as often as articles published by single authors. And he said that home run articles, those that are cited a um, hundred times or more, are six times more likely to be written by uh, gr a group authors, uh, a group of authors than by uh, a single author. Um, which is, uh, uh, I, I found, a rather uh, interesting uh, phenomenon. And it would seem that um, Einstein or Darwin that's that sort of research, although they certainly worked with other people. That sort of uh, single man, great genius uh, research um, isn't, doesn't seem to be as productive today or as common today as perhaps it was um, once in history. Group work is here to stay, and what is the best template for this kind of, of group work? So Lara went on to talk about research by Charlene Nemeth, who is um, uh, a researcher at Berkeley, and she took groups of uh, students and gave them a task, and one of her tasks was to answer this question, how can traffic congestion be reduced in the San Francisco Bay Area? That's a question that's of interest to me because I teach a seminar on the impact of the automobile on American culture and environment. I thought that was kind of interesting. And um, she divided them, the, the, the students up into groups of three, and uh, some of the groups, she said, just brainstorm. Freewheeling, don't criticize anybody, just brainstorm. The classic brainstorming model. Another group was a control group, do whatever you want. Another group was brainstorm, but criticize the ideas that you hear. Talk about them, 
try to improve upon them, reject those that are no good, accept those that are good. And so what she found out was that um, th there were far more better, far more good ideas um, uh, in answer to that question from uh, the students who were asked to brainstorm, but then to debate and critique um, the ideas. And she uh, argues that um, imagination can thrive on conflict, that dissent encourage us, encourages us to engage more with the work of others and to reassess our own viewpoints. And this is a quote of hers. Perhaps some of you, this will resonate with some of you. Um, there's this Pollyanna-ish notion that the most important thing to do when working together is to stay positive and to get along, not to hurt anyone's feelings. Well, that's just wrong. True creativity requires some trade-offs. Authentic dissent can be difficult, but it's always invigorating. It wakes us right up. And, and I agree with that. I think some level of dissent can be very beneficial. That's one of the reasons why we want Gettysburg to be a more diverse place. We want more political views. We want it to be more racially diverse. We want it to be more diverse um, across many, many uh, 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 different um, uh, variables. And um, I think that that's uh, uh, a good thing for Gettysburg College. Yes, we want the college to be a safe place where we can all speak, um, where, where people are comfortable. But staying in your comfort zone for four years is a recipe for intellectual uh, disaster. I, I enjoy making students feel uncomfortable. Um, that's my job, and, um, and I love my job. Uh, uh, so uh, diversity and dissent, I think, are important in promoting group success um, and, and what else might be important. So Lara goes on and, and talks about the work of Isaac Kahane at Harvard Medical School, who analyzed 35,000 scientific articles, and he mapped the precise location of every author on the author list on these 35,000 scientific articles. And what he found was that when co-authors, maybe he worked in a team, <laughs> I don't know, maybe he was a co-author. When co-authors were close together, paper quality was higher. And the be this blew me away. The best research was consistently produced when scientists worked within 10 meters of each other. 10 meters of each other. And uh, articles um, with the uh, uh, lowest numbers of citations were those where the uh, co-authors um, were, were worked more than one kilometer um, apart. Um, and he went on to say that even in the era of big science, when researchers spend so much time on the internet, it's still so important to create intimate spaces. And this should sound familiar to anyone who was a student of Jane Jacobs, um, uh, who, who said that um, incidental con um, conversations and knowledge spillovers um, occur most readily when people bump into each other face to face. Presumably that's why you're, you're all here tonight. Um, and a really good example of this is Building 20 at, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a building probably no one has ever heard of, although if you're from Boston, there used to be uh, a store called Building 19 and a half. Anyone remember that? that? All righty. Um, building 20 was built in 1942 at MIT in response to the war. Um, it was a, a research center. It was a big, bland, quickly thrown up uh, uh, vanilla-type building. Um, um, and being a temporary building, it, it was up for 56 years before it was demolished. And uh, that's probably a good thing for us. Because after the war, it was a space that nobody wanted. And MIT threw all kinds of people into it. These were the groups that were in that, in that building. The Electronics Research Lab the nuclear science lab. Noam Chomsky and his linguistics department was in that building. The machine shop, the particle accelerator, ROTC, the piano repair shop, the acoustics lab, the cell culture lab, and the model railroad club. 
Um, and the people in that building did amazing, amazing research. Um, it's legendary space, one of the most creative spaces in the world. And the first video game was developed there. Bose speakers were developed there. Um, Chomsky's ideas about the deep structure of language were developed there. He drew from biology, psychology, and computer science, all of which were represented in Building 20. People interacted there who never would have spoken to each other otherwise. Now, as it turns out, Lair goes on to say, Steve Jobs was fanatical. Was fan well, he was fanatical, but he was fanatical about um, this concept of adjacency, this, this concept of, of proximity. You may remember that he was also the head of Pixar for a while, and, uh, and when uh, he was um, at Pixar headquarters, he moved the mailboxes to the central atrium so people would uh, bump into each other more. That worked pretty well. So then he moved the cafeteria there. And that worked pretty well. So then he moved the coffee bar and the gift shop there. And then finally he moved the bathrooms there. At one time, those were the only bathrooms in, the whole, in all of Pixar, right there in the atrium. People rebelled against that, evidently, a little bit later on. Um, hallway culture, this concept of hallway culture is very, very important. And architects and college administrators often ignore that it even exists. Um, and it's very interesting to me, I, I just read the book uh, Triumph of the City by Edward Glazer in order to prepare for my, my car seminar, and Silicon Valley is the nation's epicenter for the computer and information technology industry. Why? Because of spin-offs from Stanford University and then other Bay Area academic institutions. And almost every technology leader uh, or every company is based in, in Silicon Valley or has, uh, has roots there. Um, and I, I find that uh, this is very, very ironic. Again, it's the idea of acting like muscles in a muscle clump. The very industry that is trying so hard to get us to use technology to connect people is based in one central location because face-to-face -face interactions are super important and make the world go round. So yes, Skype and eBay and Facebook um, all have their roles to play, um, uh, as do online education providers, for example. Uh, they're based on the idea that people don't need to sit in a room together, eat together, work in a lab together, act in a play together, get drunk together, play sports together, have sex together, drive in a van to Assateague Island or the Outer Banks or North Carolina or the coast of Maine together. Um, uh, I, you know, I can't think of a worse concept than telecommuting. Phoning it in, that's, that's the best we can do. Um, that might produce adequate results, but is that really what we're aiming for? Um, uh, honey, uh, how was work today? Adequate. <laughs> I mean, it, it's not really perhaps what a school like Gettysburg College is, is aiming for. Um, so to summarize, intellectual activity is enhanced when people with different perspectives work, discuss, criticize, and argue face to face in frequent, unplanned, and often messy ways, just like my house when I grew up. Now the D in TED stands for, very good, very good. So how to design a bad college. I've got three and a half minutes to design a bad college. Okay, here are my recommendations for designing a bad college. Number one, create acad I won't give the numbers, that takes up too much time. Create academic departments of like-minded individuals. Put them in discrete, isolated spaces away from other departments. Give faculty the tools to stay home and interact via email with each other and with students. Encourage faculty to come to campus only on the days they teach. Encourage faculty to hold regular office hours, but to, hold their, to close their doors at all other times. Encourage faculty to avoid working with students during the summer. Tell new faculty that college service, serving on committees, uh, speaking at TED, won't count when they go up for tenure. Um, reinforce this concept by not measuring and assessing college service. Reward faculty who believe that student interactions are interruptions, not opportunities. 
Build the campus as far from town as possible. Build campus buildings as far from each other as possible. Save money by making classrooms and class sizes as large as possible. Build classrooms with desks, tables, and chairs bolted to the floor. Build classrooms with a PowerPoint screen right in front of the blackboard. Encourage faculty to use PowerPoint and turn the lights off when doing so. Encourage faculty to put as many lines of text as possible on each PowerPoint slide, preferably using gray text on a gray background. <laughs> Match each first year student with a like-minded roommate. Create special interest houses, fraternities, and sororities where like-minded students can live together and avoid other students who don't look like them, think like them, act like them, or have parents who earn the same amount of money. Put TV screens in all public spaces. Put TV screens tuned to ESPN in all public spaces. <laughs> Give students the tools to stay in their rooms and encourage them to avoid face-to-face -face interactions with faculty, advisors, librarians, groundskeepers, um, and coaches. Um, almost done. Put required reading material on Moodle so students won't have to go to the library and interact with any other students. Put lectures on Moodle so students won't have to go to class and interact with any other students. Put all course material on Moodle so students can just stay in their rooms, play video games, and watch porn. <laughs> Hell, uh, put the entire curriculum on Moodle so students can just stay in New Jersey, live in the basement, play video games, and watch porn. And finally, remember, never, ever make other people feel uncomfortable. Thank you very much.